around the world, the Spirit is moving and a voice is being heard. Welcome to the Voice of Evangelism with David Langford. You can write to the Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. We'll give you that address again at the close of today's broadcast. But here now is David Langford. Hello, friends. David Langford here today, and we'd like to welcome each of you to the Voice of Evangelism International Ministries. As always, it is our prayer that our Lord Jesus Christ is ministering to your heart and your life and your every need. The coming days are going to demand a prayer life. The days are going to demand consecration, dedication. We can no longer be complacent or apathetic in our walk with God. We must be committed, committed wholly to the Lord Jesus Christ. The days that we are living in, as I said yesterday, are perilous or full of danger, full of trouble. Sadly, it will get worse because before Christ returns, a lot of tumultuous, tempestuous things are going to transpire. Well, how can you say that? Because of Matthew chapter 24, Mark chapter 13, and Luke chapter 21, and of course, the book of Revelation. A lot of things are happening in the earth. God has said they will happen, and they will happen. Mortal men cannot change the divine plan and word of God. All we can do is to get in compliance with what God's going to do. And the more you stay in the word of the Lord, the greater you will comply to what he wills for your life. Let me say this today. Being in the will of God is not always easy. You think, if I'm in the perfect will of God, it's a cakewalk. No, 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 no. As a matter of fact, it is anything but a cakewalk. I think about Joseph, everything that was happening to him in the natural that you could see with your natural eye was negative, everything. From the time Jacob, his dad, sent him to check on the brothers, at 17 years of age, for the next 13 years, it would be, in essence, one catastrophe after another. And just about the time he thinks, man, what God has promised me is about to come to fruition, bam, slammed, thrown off track again. But in God's perfect time, he took Joseph from the pit to the palace. And God's time, that's why that verse Psalms 3115 is so powerful and so significant and so important where David said, my times are in your hand. Whether it's a good time, a bad time, a happy time, a broken time, a prosperous time, a anemic time, whatever kind of time it is, David said, my times are in your hand. Psalms 31 verse 15. So wherever that you find yourself and what's taking place in that time, it is in the hands of God. He is sovereign. Let me make mention of our Revival in America meeting this coming September the 20th through the 22nd. Two services Friday morning, one service Friday night, two services Saturday morning, one service Saturday night, 
And then one more service on Saturday, excuse me, Sunday morning. Sunday morning. That's Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And I'll be preaching on Sunday morning, serving communion. And we're looking for a a move of God that'll touch your heart and your life. Amen. Please let us know if you're able to come. Email us at our website. There's a place there that says contact us or write us at Post Office Box 502, Kaser, C-A-S-A-R, North Carolina, 28020, or phone us, 704-538-8060. Bring someone with you. This is going to be a tempestuous year. I anticipate some bad things happening. I encourage you, I invite you to be prepared in every sense of the word. You got China, Taiwan, all the things that are happening in the Middle East. Lately, it looks like this war with Israel and Hamas, Hezbollah, was going to spill over in some areas that would not be conducive to peace and placidity. Satan, oh, how he steals, he kills, and he destroys. Amen. We want to go today here in Psalms chapter 37. We want to look at verse 31. The law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. None of his steps shall slide. The law of his God is in his heart. Now, this is not specifically talking about the Mosaic law, but this speaks to all the precepts, all the commandments concerning the Word of God. The Word of God is voluminous. The Word of God cannot be exhausted. There's always something more to learn, something more to comprehend, something more to get into your spirit. As you grow in the Lord, your revelation knowledge grows exponentially. Your spiritual insight, your ability to see, your ability to discern, At 69 years of age, many times as I read my Bible and I I see a word and I say to myself, this is what I believe it means, but nevertheless, I will look it up in the strong, exhaustive concordance. When I look it up, it meant what I thought it meant. What am I saying? Maturity allows you to read and see things and you're able to discern in your heart and your spirit. This is the application. This is the meaning. That only happens because of maturity. It's like in the secular world, you may hear a word, you may not have ever heard it used, but in the way it was used in the sentence, you knew what it meant. That's because you are wise, you are prudent, you understand things. And because of the way the word was used, the application, you discern it. So it is in the scriptures. The more you read the word of God, the more you avail yourself to the word of God, the greater you understand it. 
Psalms 119, verse 130. The entrance of thy word giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple. When you allow the word of God to come into your life and find a place of residence, that word will forever affect you in a positive way. And when I say positive, it may mean in, a, in an application, don't do that, don't say that, don't go there. But that remains a positive application because God is preserving and keeping you from something. Psalms 119, verse 11. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. God's word abiding in your heart is a deterrent to sin, to evil, to wickedness. This is why it is important to hide the word of God in your heart. This is why it is important to live a life that you are daily pursuing the Lord and you're studious in his word. Luke 24, 45 says, Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Now, if you look at that, you study that out. That was as though God gave them a measure of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, though he were not yet come. But he was helping the disciples to begin to understand things. When Christ was around them prophesying his passion, death, burial, and resurrection, this, for the most part, they didn't understand. It was beyond their ability to comprehend because if you think about it in the natural, I'm going to be crucified. He said to the whole world publicly, John 2, 19, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. He was telling them what's going to happen to him. I'm going to be crucified. I'll be buried. But in three days I will rise again. But to demonstrate the carnality and the inability to see what he was saying... The Jews answered Christ, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, there in John 2 and 20, then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and will thou rear it up in three days? Remember verse 19, the one before it, verse 19, John 2, 19, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. He's talking about his physical body, his literal body. Because they lacked understanding, they could not see, discern, or know. They thought he was talking about Herod's temple. They're saying, are you kidding me? Are you, you can't be serious. Destroy this august, magnificent temple, and in three days, you're going to rear it up? Man, don't you know it took 40 years? And six years to build this. You know, typically, <coughs> excuse me, typically a home is built in six months to 12, six to 12 months as a general rule. Now, there are weather things, anomalies that impede sometimes that schedule to be met. But in general, six to 12 months, a typical home is built. When you study Herod's temple, there was nothing like it. Coming to the temple, it was so ornate. The border around the top of the temple was gilded, overlaid with gold. They had golden spikes around the top of the temple, the ledge. Those spikes kept birds from nesting or sitting and defecating. It was, it, was a, it was a miraculous design wherein birds could not perch there and defecate on the temple. This temple was unbelievable. And they said, it took 40 and six years to build this temple. And you're saying, tear it down, destroy it, three days? 
I'll raise it up. They couldn't understand. Even the disciples whom he handpicked, had they believed what he said, they would have been at the tomb that he was placed and buried in on the third day to be there when he arose from the dead. They were not there. Because in the natural, Christ is dead and he's not coming back to life. But he, he prophesied it. He prophesied this. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. He told them this is what's going to happen. But they couldn't grasp it. And he began to reveal to them things. Following his resurrection, one of the, one of the great things that he did, he, 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 it was, there was over 500 people that saw Christ. Paul said some of them, for the, main, for the most of them, are alive to this day. Some have already passed away and gone on. Israel, the disciples were concerned about him restoring the kingdom back to Israel. Acts 1 and 6, they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? He said, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons, but the Father hath put it in his own power, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. They wanted to know, when will you give us the kingdom back? He said, that's, that's not important. That's not important. Men don't have their priorities in order, and they, neither did they at that time. If you back up there to Acts 1, verse 3, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, suffering, and death by many infallible proofs. There were infallible proofs that Jesus was raised from the dead, being seen of them 40 days and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now, let me say this. I would love to know everything that Christ said to them about the kingdom of God, yet were not recorded. Jesus said things. He shared things. He revealed things, but not everything was recorded. How do we know that? John 21 and verse 25. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. There in Acts 1, 3, I would, have, I would love to have known or love to know everything that Christ said pertaining to the kingdom of God. John tells us if everything that Jesus did the which if they should be written, every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. That's how voluminous, that's how copious the things that Christ spoke were and did, of course. But <laughs> it's amazing what little bit we do have. We argue, we fuss, and we fight over it because of religion. Isn't it amazing how that the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders in Jerusalem, 
looked at Peter, James, and John, they were per, they perceived they were ignorant and unlearned men. But they took knowledge. They noticed they had been with Jesus. Ignorant and unlearned. Ignorant means not knowing. Unlearned, they were no, by no means educated. Education is wonderful. But education without salvation is damnation. Look at all the educated people in the world and look how messed up they are. All the three women, like Miss Gay, the black lady, all three of those ladies lost their jobs because of their stupid answers. You might say they were ignorant and unlearned when they were being questioned by the lady congressman from New York. Stephanie, I believe is her name. I'm not sure if that's exactly how it's pronounced. But they were talking about anti-Semitism. And, of course, they were attempting in their humanity, their flawed mentation, to skew the truth, the answer, the right answer. It cost them their jobs. Now, I would look at that as a country boy and say, you know what? They're just plain out stupid. You say, that's rather harsh. <laughs> Don't run around talking about your Ph.D., your doctorate, et cetera, et cetera, and you can't answer one simple question about anti-Semitism, and you want to pontificate, you want to elaborate on your intelligence and your degrees. Just like Biden's wife, Jill Biden. She demands you call her Dr. Biden. Yet these people, look, look at the condition of America and these people demand you honor my doctorate, you honor my PhD, you honor my master's, whatever that it might be. Simple, simple is the way we should keep things if we can. KISS, K-I-S-S, keep it simple, stupid. But see, rhetorical jargon and garbage convolutes truth. Thus Jesus said, let your yea be yea and your nay, nay. Simply put, yes or no. But they want to give a thesis. They want to give a Thesis, paragraph after paragraph, page after page. Just answer it yes or no. You see, words, copious amounts of word, twist and convolute the actual truth. Art thou the Christ? Jesus said, thou hast said. It wasn't a great long thesis. Uh, 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 a, a, a copious amount of words. Y yes, I am. You said it. Yes, I am. I am the Christ. See, in his humility, he didn't want to be overly and outspoken, embracing his humility. Not once did he draw on his deity for himself. I want you to remember that. We never see Christ at any time drawing on his deity for himself personally. That was why in Matthew chapter 4, Luke chapter 4, when the devil was engaging Christ, he was trying to tempt Christ in his humanity, his flesh, to satisfy his flesh through his deity. 
If thou art the Christ, command this stone be made bread. He was appealing to Christ's deity to satisfy his humanity. And of course, Christ said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Three times Satan sought to tempt Christ to get him to draw on his deity to save his humanity. He took him up to the pinnacle of the temple. Cast yourself off. In other words, jump off this temple. And as you're in the air falling to the ground, call angels to catch you, to capture you, lest you dash your foot, your heel against a stone. He wanted Christ to do a carnal, fleshly act and draw upon his deity to accomplish that. Every time Jesus said it is written and gave him Bible verses, you know what is so powerful, so dynamic, so uplifting about that story in Christ's life? He's telling you and I, the same word that I use to defeat the devil, you can use the same identical words and defeat him yourself because the power is in the word of God. Satan always appealed to Christ's flesh so that he would draw on his deity for himself. And Jesus understood what the devil was doing. Jesus even said to those around him at the cross, do you not know I could ask of my father 12 legion of angels, and I could deliver myself. But again, he did not draw on his deity for his humanity. He was made flesh and blood so that he might die a natural death just like all men. He died a natural death in the sense he died just like all human beings die. He became flesh and blood. He took on the very nature of men. You and I are made up of flesh and blood. Hebrews 2, 9, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Hebrews 2.14, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he, Christ, also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of the devil, that is the devil. That he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Jesus did not draw on his deity for his humanity. Think of that. He was all man, yet he was all God. Now you think about obedience. Paul in Philippians 3 talks about Christ being obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He, he Paul was magnifying the obedience of Christ relative to Calvary. Relative to Calvary. Absolute, total obedience. Wouldn't it be nice if we could say that about ourselves when we, you might say, are struggling? I said Philippians 3, Philippians 2. Obedient, Obedient even unto death, the death of the cross. It was, this wasn't just a, a death. It was death by the means of the cross. The cross was used to take his life. Of course, he said, no man takes it, I lay it down. He willingly laid down his life. 
That's why his obedience was so powerful. That's why your obedience is so significant. You know, we can fast, we can pray, we can give 50% tithes, 90% tithes to the work of God. That does not please God. God is, is pleased when we are obedient. Obedient. You know, I look back over my own personal life. I'm grateful to God the ability he gave me in being obedient. You know, quitting my job and going full-time in the ministry. You know, now I'm, I'm old. All that's past. That's all behind me. But see, God blesses obedience. God rewards obedience. This is why Paul talks so much about Christ. He's highly exalted him, given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things beneath the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, because Jesus satisfied the Father's will in everything that he did, even unto death. What obedience. You know, we struggle in obedience. You know, we, we, we struggle when God says, bless that person with a $100 bill. Are you sure? Are you sure, Lord? Is this you, Lord? <laughs> Brother Brian Campbell says, I have gotten him in trouble now a lot. When he sees someone at a restaurant or, or a place where they're eating and they see people bow their heads and pray, they go over and they pick up their tab. He's, he said, man, I've been, I've been buying a lot of meals lately. Don't think God does not bless your giving. And you'll forget that. But when we stand before God at the Bema seat of Christ, he's going to judge that because that was a good work. That was a display of Christ. That was a manifestation of Christ in our lives by helping others. I love to be a blessing. You know, somebody wrote me a few weeks ago from California, and I discerned in the letter, it was a, it was a smart aleck question. It was a, it was a, a, a contentious question. What do you do besides radio and television? You know, I wanted to write the guy back and say, what do you do besides nothing? That was, that was the air, you know. I said, besides radio and television, I fast, I pray. I immerse myself daily in the scriptures. I help widows. I help orphans. I help missionaries. I, I, I help other works, other ministry works, people who are involved in homes where they take in drug addicts. We don't, we don't sit here and talk about all the things we do. We preach the word of God. But I could sense the arrogance and the question, like all I do is radio and television, and it's just, you know, a couple hours a week. I probably work... 70 to 90 hours every week, every week. I do not take what I do lightly, and forgive me if I sound arrogant or pompous. That's not my point. My point is praying every day, reading the Bible every day, preparing material every day, writing newsletters every day, working, trying to get ahead, recording TV, recording radio programs, answering scores of emails every week, trying to return phone calls, trying to answer letters, trying to put together a conference, this person, that person, doing this, doing that. We have to work. 
but I, I sensed in the letter uh, uh, an arrogance that you don't do nothing. You know, you just comb your hair and trim your beard and put on your suit of clothes. <laughs> oh, my, my. You know, it's amazing how the mind manipulates people. Your mind can have a perception that is as wrong as wrong can be, and yet you think you're right. You think you're right. When people are, and and this is maybe a poor analogy, it's been said when people do their job well, it looks easy. It looks easy, but they don't know the time, the effort they've put in to mature their skills and their gifts, and it does look, it does appear to be easy. It does appear to be simplistic, but it's not, and it never was. You know, people ask me about radio, TV. I don't have a live audience to respond to me. I talk to you, though, as you were sitting right here with me in the studio, transparent, forthright, try to be sincere and not some air, something fake. You know, I I am what I am by the grace of God. But ministry... Is is basically 24-7. I can't tell you the number of people that call each week and say, can you call me? Can you call me? Can I talk to you? People call, will you counsel us? Will you counsel us online? Let's do a Zoom call. I don't counsel. I don't feel qualified to counsel, so I preach the Word of God. The Word of God can fix anything that's broken. I'm not saying don't get counsel. There's safety in the multitude of counsel. Depends on what kind of counsel you're looking for. I've learned in life, prayer and the Holy Scriptures will fix a lot of brokenness in your life if you will submit yourself to His lordship. Let him have a place in your life. Don't focus on yourself. Focus on others. Help somebody accomplish something. Help somebody do something. Help somebody reach their goal. Too much effort, time, and energy is spent on self today. Don't focus on yourself. Focus on Christ, and he will help you to minister to others. Remember 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, Paul said, For men shall be lovers of their own selves. I shared this the most popular photo in the world. The number one photo in the world is a selfie. I'm glad I've never taken one. But you see people constantly taking pictures of themselves. And Paul said they're going to be lovers of themselves. The energy, the effort, the focus is on the person. That was the spirit of Satan, Lucifer. I will, I will be, I will, I will. Jesus didn't say, I will. He said, thy will. You see the difference? He wasn't focused on himself. He was focused on the Father's will. Thy will be done. When we get into the right alignment with God, the focus will not be on us, but the focus will be on the Lord and his word. See, that's, that's, that's where the focus should be. 
So when the psalmist says here in Psalms 37, 31, the law of his God, who's your God? That's the other question. Who is your God? The law of his God. See, if, if Satan is your God, your life is filled with turmoil because it's full of covetousness. It's full of greed. It's full of lying. It is full of cheating. It is full of self-gratification. It's, it's full of all the wrong things. But if God's word and Holy Spirit is in you, he says, if God's law is in his heart, none of his steps shall slide. None of his goings will slide. You won't backslide. You know, I was so glad when I came back to the Lord in 1978, I was 23 years old, 23 years old in four months. And I know it was the Lord who helped me understand immediately. It didn't take me years to learn this. I learned it right off the bat. I wasn't taught it, but I learned it right off the bat when I came back to the Lord because that was my failure. And that is when I do fail God, I don't quit. When I was a teenager and I failed God, I quit. I would say to myself, you can't live right. You don't have any Christian friends hardly at all. And in high school and things like that, you know, the, the peer pressure, the drugs. Uh, I, just, when I, was, I was 18 years old when I was first introduced to marijuana pot. Introduced to Boone's Farm Wine, I was probably... 15, going on 16, you know, getting um, propositions from the world. And then I would mess up, and I felt bad about it. Oh, I felt so bad when I messed up. And finally, I just said one day, I can't live right, and I quit. I just quit. Then I went down a road of chaos, heartache, hardship, calamity, I can't tell you the car wrecks I've been in. Stupid stuff. But when I came back to the Lord in June of 1978, it was though it was in eight. It was within me. If you mess up, don't quit. Just ask God to forgive you and keep going on. And so I did. I didn't let my failures ruin me, destroy me, or identify me. You can let your failures keep you harnessed to the past. I can't make it. I can't do it. Every time I try, I fail. Oh, quit mealy-mouthing. Quit having a pity party. Get up. Ask God to forgive you. And as I heard one fellow say, live right one day at a time. Then you got two days under your belt, three days and four days and 10 days and three weeks and then a month and then two months and so on and so forth. And you see just like a newborn babe begins to grow. When that baby's born, it don't have any teeth. So it has to be fed with milk. But it's not but a few months down the road and all of a sudden the gums get sore and all of a sudden, a little tooth, a little bitty tooth begins to appear. You see, naturally, God is preparing that child's body because it's growing for food, real nourishment and sustenance. And then there comes a point in your life as a child, you lose your teeth and you get permanent teeth. The only thing that God gave us two sets of, two sets of teeth. As you grow, you're going you're gonna to stumble at times. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to sin. But you never quit. You never quit. You acknowledge your sins. If you don't acknowledge it, the Holy Ghost will bring it to your mind and say, hey, you need to deal with that. See, God's going to keep his body pure. He's going to keep his body holy. 
And if you're a part of his body, if you're not living right, he will deal with you about how you're living. And you know what? Let me say this today. I don't know why, but in the last 90 days, the subject of shacking up and living together has just overrun me with people calling, writing, etc. Because God is trying to deal with their fornication and their cohabitation, and it's not right. It is evil. It is wrong. You don't provide for the flesh. God says get married. Do this thing right. And it's like in the last 90 days, I've had more people phone and call. And the answer is very simple. Get out of your lifestyle of fornication. And don't give me this garbage, well, we're married in our hearts. What a cop-out. What a cop-out. There had to be some record of marriages in the Bible because they talked about Moses giving them a bill, a document of divorcement. Why would you need that document? You needed that document because there was a document that says you were married. There was a record. There was, there was recorded somewhere. See? But it was never, Jesus told him, it was never so in the beginning, but only because of the hardness of your heart. See? <laughs> People are always looking for a, 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 a way out, a, a way to, to live in sin and justify it. You, you can't do that. You might fool yourself. You might lie to yourself, and you might deceive yourselves. That doesn't make it right. Matthew 19, verse 7. They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? This is how Jesus answered them. Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. It was never right. See, my point is a writing of divorcement, some type of document. Why would you need a bill, a writing of sorts, to nullify the marriage, to offset it? See, in general, it's, a, it's a, against the law to be a polygamist in America. <laughs> I could I could tell you some stories you wouldn't believe. But that's not my job. My job is to preach the word. There's a right way and there's the wrong way. Proverbs chapter 14 verse 12 there is a way which seemeth right unto a man but the end thereof are the ways of death. I've learned this in life about people. People can find a way to justify anything. Don't do that. All you will do is sear your conscience. Be honest with yourself. You know, there's nothing like making an honest evaluation about who and what you are. The closer you get to God, the more you will understand who and what you are. You will see, you will grasp. I need to make a change here. I need to make a change there. I'm coming short here. I'm coming short there. Whatever happened to balanced Christianity, what happened to that? What happened to that about having conviction? And when you're watching a purported movie and there's all this vile and excess cursing and language, how do you sit there, listen to that, and justify that? How do you do it? 
How do you look at nudity and justify that? You can't. Now, you can sear your conscience. <laughs> you can sear your conscience. This is how you backslide. This is what the psalmist is saying. The law of his God is in his heart, not in his head, in his heart. None of his steps, none of his goings shall slide or backslide because God's word is a perpetual deterrent in your life. When Jesus said he would bring all things back, talking about the Holy Ghost, he will bring back to your remembrance all these things that I have said. Now, you may not know the actual uh, book, the chapter, the exact verse of, of, of something, but because you've read it somewhere down the road, God will bring it back to your remembrance. And that word will quicken you. That word will correct you. That word will reprove you. That word will rebuke you. When the Holy Ghost is come, he'll say to you, that's not right. I'm telling you, I gave my heart to the Lord when I was 12 years old. I was baptized in the Holy Ghost when I was 12 years old. I was in the sixth grade. I used to come home from school, and there was a, a little service station across the street from my grandparents' house. Miss Christie was her name, Miss Christie. It was called uh, Christie's gas station or Christie store or whatever it was, but I remember her last name was Christy. And she had a, a bubble gum machine in there and it had speckle balls. Some of you listening to me remember the speckle ball machine. And if you got a speckle ball, that was worth a nickel. And then I could buy a Reese's peanut butter cup for a nickel. You could put a penny in it and they got newer machines that would also take a nickel. And if you put a nickel in there, you spun it five times. On Sunday night, I received the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Monday morning, I got up, I went to school. Sixth grade, I come home from school, I walked to school. And that Monday afternoon, I went to Miss Christie's store. And I went to put my money in the speckle ball bubble gum machine and here's what I heard in my spirit, 12 years old. Don't do that. That's gambling. Now, now, <laughs> uh, that may sound cynical and foolish to some of you because I never played cards. I never shot dice. I never done anything like that at 12 years of age. God was trying to teach me principles very early on. I became a prolific gambler while I was backslid. I love to play poker, five card, draw, whatever the case might be. Wasn't too crazy about blackjack, but I love poker. I love to bluff people. I love to, to, to stare people down and make them think one thing when I'm sitting there and I ain't got nothing in my hand. My point is, as a child, the Holy Ghost was trying to teach me, said, don't do that, that's gambling. And I never put another penny or nickel in that bubble gum machine to get a speckle ball. I'd come in there in the afternoons, shake that thing up. Miss Christie said, what are you doing? I said, I'm shaking this machine up. I'm going to get me a speckle ball. And I'm telling you, I got a lot of speckle balls. But see, the Holy Ghost as a child says, don't do that. That's not right. So I, I quit it. It doesn't matter if you're sincere with God, he will help you with everything in your life. I'm trying to tell you there's nothing that God will not help you in regarding your life and your lifestyle if you will listen to him. We all hear from the Lord in, 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 through the Holy Spirit and the word of God. He said, my sheep know my voice. 
You know when the Holy Ghost says, don't do that, don't say that, don't go there, get away from there. Your buddy calls and says, let's go to the bar tonight and uh, have a few drinks or whatever the case might be. You say, no, I can't do that. I quit that. And sometimes you need to speak up. Let people know you're a Christian. Don't be a closet Christian. Let them know why you're not going. That'll make you stronger. That's why you have a testimony. You've been tested and you've overcome. They overcame him by the word of their testimony and the blood of the lamb. Read it. It's the Bible. When you when you share your testimony, you're reinforcing the convictions you have in your life. So, Revelation 12, 11, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. You overcome when you testify of what God has done in your life. Someone may say to you, well, why don't you do that? Well, why don't you curse? Why, why don't you smoke pot? Why don't you snort coke? Why, why don't you do that? Because I'm a Christian. Opens up a door right then to tell somebody about Jesus. Now, they may shut you down. They may turn you off, and that's all right. But by the expression of your testimony, that makes you stronger, as Barney Fife would say, to nip it in the bud. You're not giving place to the devil. You're not giving room for him to set up shop in your life. When you testify, when you have a testimony, that makes you more rigid when it comes to compromise and sin. I'm not going there. I'm not doing that. Why? Because I have shared my testimony. And to be what your testimony says you are, you have to live right. I've had people to go behind my back and ask people, is Lankford that honest? Is Lankford that straight? So they want to know, is this a front? No, it's not a front. It's how I live. I've had uh, tellers at banks to give me back too much money. I didn't keep it. I went back and I said, you gave me an extra $100 bill. I did that one time, and that lady was insulted. She said, I don't make mistakes. I said, well, here it is. I'm going to leave it on the counter, and I'm walking out because you gave me $100 bill too much. I don't make mistakes. Well, my flesh said, why don't you just keep that? Nope. I walked off, left it there because it wasn't mine. The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford is brought to you by the faithful listeners and supporters throughout America. If you're looking for an uncompromising message, we invite you to tune in each week to The Voice of Evangelism. For more information, write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. That's P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020.